Cardinal things we'll be, we'll be looking at. Number one, what is authority? Right? You, if you have a writing material, you can jot this down. What is authority? Number two, how is authority exercised? Because sometimes we talk, we talk a lot about authority, authority, believers, authority, believers, authority, that we don't know how to go about exercising it. Right? So how do I even know I have authority? Becomes the first question. And if I know I have authority, how do I exercise it? Because if I have something that I can use, it's as good as me not having it. All right? It's that, that's, that's, that's some truth there. Um, number three is, what is the scope of my authority? What, what are the limitations of my authority? What are the boundaries of my authority? Um, I, I shared a story with us some time ago about a woman who um, believed God that she, was, she, she felt she was acting in faith and also exercising her authority. Um, she believed God that somebody else's husband would die and she would marry the person. And she felt it was faith. Now, to take it a step further, she didn't just say it, she didn't just believe it, she acted it out, right? So she had a church and she had a wedding ceremony where she, in the spirit, um, did wedding with the said man whilst he was alive and the wife was alive, right? So um, we need to know. Uh, I, years ago, when we started learning um, this whole believer's authority thing, one of the days after service in church, one of our sisters in church then came, came you know, she met me and she was like, um, they used to call me Ike there in church, you know. They said, bro, Ike, I command you in the name of Jesus, give me, I think it was 200 naira. You know, that's, that's, she felt she was using authority and she was using it on me. You know, so she, she did it. She said, I command you in the name of Jesus, give me 200 naira or 500 naira. I can't remember the exact amount. And I laughed at her. But even though I laughed, I still helped her because I figured she needed money. You know, but if I, if maybe on, on a different day, she's giving testimony somewhere, she would say she heard, she was taught that you use your authority and she commanded a brother in the Lord in the name of Jesus and the brother gave her some money. She wouldn't know that the reason why I gave her that money wasn't because I, I remember really the first question I asked her was, am I a demon? Why are you commanding me in the name of Jesus? You know, but she might feel, you know, eventually what she did, you know, worked or prevailed over me. She didn't know that I just gave her that money because I, I did it out, out of compassion, compassion. Not like, not like I was compelled to do it. Not like I was commanded to do it. So these are some of the errors that some of us make sometimes, you know, um, where we begin to use authority where we don't have jurisdiction over. And we get frustrated when it's not working because we'll be taught that you shall speak to this mountain and, you know, give it a command that you should cast into the sea, it shall be done and whatsoever, blah, blah, and all of that. And you do it and it doesn't work. The president of Nigeria has authority as long as he's in Nigeria. If he steps out of, out of Nigeria and goes to the U.S. and begins to command, you know, and says there will be a lockdown in, in, in Houston, Texas from so-so and so day to so-so and so Everybody will just laugh at him because he doesn't have jurisdiction over that area, right? So what is the jurisdiction of the believer when it comes to um, authority of the believer? What, what are my limitations? Where and where can I exercise authority? We'll be looking at that in this study. Um, number four is, if God is good, why is negativity, <clears throat> why is negativity sometimes the outcome of some exercise of authority? I would explain what that means. Someone prays, I remember someone who, um, 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 a, a pastor, you know, who came to give testimony in church one day of how that there's been a man in his family that has been troubling everybody and um, he prayed against the person and the person died. You know, it, it shows us the kind of um, testimonies we share in church sometimes. You know, um, God says that it is not his will that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth, right? But somebody prays against someone to die. And sometimes you, see, you actually see that the person dies. What is the explanation to that? If God is a good God, how come such negative outcomes happen, you know, when people pray in the name of Jesus? These are important truths we're going to glean from and we'll learn rightly. Number five, we're looking at. Um, um, seven things. Number five, what authority does the devil have over the believer? 
yeah, what authority does the devil have? The um, devil, you know, the Satan, as some people call him, you know, was, what authority, what's the level of authority he has over the believer? Number six, um, it says, does the believer have authority over the devil? <clears throat> So if we understand the first part, the second part is, does the believer have authority over the devil? Number seven, where does the believer's authority derive from? Like we'll see, authority is derived power. Authority is not, um, is not power, right? Those of us who, who did um, um, government in school can explain that. I, I mean, as far, back, as far back as I can remember, those were one of the things that we used to, um, those of us who were in sciences, those are one of the things the guys in arts used to um, joke with us, you know, play, play, pick, up on, pick, pick on our heads with, you know, the difference between authority and power. So you see that authority is actually derived power, but where does our authority derive from? Because the strength of <clears throat> um, the place your authority is derived from um, would determine to a large extent the a level of, um, 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 the strength of your demand, right? We'll explain that. Then the last part is, what is the place of faith in the believer's authority? If I have authority, what is the relationship between faith and authority? Now, number one, what is authority? Authority is the power to give others, make decisions and enforce obedience. I repeat that, authority is the power to give orders, make decisions, and enforce obedience. Number two, I looked up, this, this is, these are um, definitions I picked up from different, um, um, what's it called, dictionaries. <clears throat> Number two says, authority is the power to give orders or make decisions. Number three is, authority is such power that is delegated to another. I repeat that, authority is such power that is delegated to another. So it is power delegated to someone else, right? The next one says authority is the power to enforce laws, exact obedience, command, determine, or judge. I love this definition. The next one will be my own personal definition. I coined it. You can quote me, all right? It says authority, this is, this is the one I, I saw online. I, I'll read it now. It says, authority is the power to enforce laws, exact obedience, command, determine, or judge. Now, my own definition, and I love it, says, authority is a legal right to act in the place of another as though it is that person acting. I'll take that again. Authority is the legal right. Authority is the legal right to act in the place of another as though it is that person acting, right? So um, a, a typical example would be um, our church. Nobody has the, the right to go on the altar to go and preach on a Sunday morning. Just imagine, I mean, on a Sunday morning, I'm sure um, everybody here most likely would have heard from God. Everybody here can share from the Bible. Everybody here knows you know, a John 3, 16 or so to, to preach. But you don't have, because you don't have the jurisdiction, the authority to do that, you won't do it. A, a, another example, um, remember the, the, the last time, I think it has happened to me twice now. Um, the other one, pastor came, came earlier. Um, so pastor was preaching, I think during our six hours prayers and something happened and he had to step down. So what did he do? He called me up to um, continue preaching instead before he comes back. The last time it happened was with Sister Titi. She was teaching. Something came up. An emergency came up that she had, she had to respond to. She told me um, immediately, please help me take up the teaching. Now, even though I probably would share a thing or two on the topic that was being talked about that day, I couldn't have done that that day except that they had told me to come do it. So the reason why I could stay there, even after she came back, I still stayed on teaching until I was done passing the point I was trying to pass was because she had delegated. So it was more of a legal right she had given to me to act in her state. And whilst I'm doing that, I'm doing it as though it is her that is doing it. 
So at the end of the day, you realize that authority, the um, authority is not passive. Let, let, let's, let's note this, right? Authority is not passive. You're not saying, oh, I have, I have authority in the name of I have authority, and you're not doing anything about it. The essence of authority is to do, is to act in someone's stead. As we see in all the places that Jesus gave authority to people, there was always a responsibility attached to it. That's why we, we said that there is authority, there is responsibility in authority. There is responsibility in authority. I don't know how many of you, maybe growing up, also, you know, you're a child, but because of your age um, or your position in the family, when your parents want to step out, they call you being a child and tell you, take care of your other siblings. Now, you have the same tendencies as they do, as they have, right? But they call you and tell you, take care of your other siblings, ensure this doesn't happen. Now, even though you would have loved to play like they would play, break plates as, as much as they would want to break plates, you can't do that because responsibility has not been put on your shoulders through authority that has been delegated to you. So if your other siblings would do something wrong and your parents would naturally be the one to correct them, you will now have the authority to correct them in the place of your parents, right? And at other times, you can even enforce um, discipline um, when something goes wrong. So that's, so you see here that authority is not passive. Please. Some of the things I'm saying, let's note, let's take note of them. Authority is not passive. Authority is active in nature. Authority is not um, in the folding of hands. If you have authority, there's something that needs to be done. There's order that needs to be created. So if God gives you, gives um, um, me authority, there is a reason why God is committing authority to Mumi. So if Mumi has the authority and does not know why it has been given to her, she would most likely not make the most of the responsibility that God has committed into, into her hands. Right? Awesome. So um, a few other notes. Authority is derived and it has no consideration for the ability of whom. Now, this is very important. Authority is derived. Derived means it's not, um, it's taken from somewhere. It comes from somewhere. Um, a, a, a good example would be um, there are certain, certain um, products that are derived from something else, right? Um, um, yam is not a derived commodity, right? That's, that's a good example. Yam is not a derived commodity. What you derive, what you can derive from yam is cassava flakes or what we call dairy, right? That's a derived commodity. But yam is in its natural state. But if you make um, pounded yam from yam, you have not derived something else from it, right? So authority is derived and it has no consideration for the ability of whom on which it is bestowed upon. <clears throat> I'll take that again. Authority is derived and it has no consideration for the ability of whom on which it, that authority is bestowed upon. Now, a very good example would be law enforcers. Law enforcers ride on authority placed on them by the government and not by any form of physical strength. I've used that as an example before when I thought how that you could be driving on in the middle of the road and a last more official or wherever you're watching from, you know, um, an official just stops you. On, on a natural day, if I see somebody who is dressed in a, no matter how nicely dressed you, you, you are, if I see you on the road, I won't stop for you. But uh, there have been times when even I was running late for an appointment and somebody on uniform stops me. Now, in his physical strength, he doesn't have the power to stop a moving car. By his physical strength, he wouldn't even stop me because I wouldn't listen to him. The only reason why they can stop you in the middle of a moving like you're, you're in transit and just by the wave of a hand, you see that you stop. is because authority has been invested on them. I take that a step further, right? Even the traffic lights stop you now in Lagos because authority, you know, if you do go act against that thing, you'll be breaking law. So even without anybody telling you anything, when you see the red lights, you know you're supposed to stop and you don't argue it. So that's what authority is. Authority is you acting in somebody's strength 
It has no business, no nothing to do about what you can do by yourself. Authority is you. So if Christ says, if you, if by the time we study now, you see that Jesus has given you authority. If he's telling you to act, he's not telling you to act in your strength. That's why it will be wrong of you to begin to look down on yourself. Second Corinthians 5, verse 15. It says, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. For even though we knew Christ once after the flesh, from henceforth now know we him no more like that. Right? I've explained this. Because Christ is in you, your reality is who you are in Christ. So if you look down, if you look upon yourself for strength, I mean, how do you act against the devil? Um, um, Smith Wigglesworth of, of blessed memory. I, I love to share that story of how that he was um, he was sleeping or so. I think he went for a program, and I mean a lot of things happened. Smith, uh, Smith was a, a a one of one of the um, oldies old time preachers I love so much. You know when he comes and he wants to teach on a regular service day, the first thing he does is that he does miracles. Right, so he says he just comes on the altar and says the first person to come onto this platform will be healed of any disease they are coming with, like that confidence. Right, he says the first person that comes on this platform will be healed of any disease they are, they have that they are coming with, and anybody who comes up first, he ministers to the person, and every time they get healed, then after getting healed, he would heal one person, then preach. Then after preaching, he would have a healing line. After, I mean, sharing the gospel and all of that, he would then have a healing line. Now, the reason for that first miracle was it opens people's hearts to receive. You know, I don't know if you've, if you've ever been in a service where somebody was healed, you know, somebody was delivered, like healing and all of that. You would see that everybody's heart is receptive, right? Even Jesus healed people, you know, <clears throat> and majority of the times they, they followed him not for the words that he taught, but for the miracles that he did. So if they had a following from the miracles that they did, they could now, that's the place, that's the um, right use of miracles, where you use it to open people up to receive the word of God, such that they cannot act in their, um, 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 according to what the Bible says, right? And I've said this over and over again, we are not a church that does not believe in miracles. We are just saying, don't put miracles in the place of doctrine. You don't build a man by miracles. You build him by teaching, by doctrine, right? So Smith was, that was, was such a man, right? And one of the days he went for a program, and after the program, he was tired. He was sleeping in the middle of the night, and he, he heard, he was upstairs, and he came, I, I think he was in the room or something, and he just came, and he was hearing, you know, like thief was in, in the house, scattering everything, scattering the chairs, scattering the tables, and he came down, turned on the light, and saw a demon, but he said it was the devil, right? So he saw, he saw a demon, or he saw the devil, according to him, he said it was, it was the devil. So he saw the devil, and he was like, oh, it is you, devil, and he went back to sleep. Now, Smith Wigglesworth in himself against the devil would most likely be destroyed. But what gave him the confidence to look at the devil and say, it's you, you're a toothless being. And he went back to that. He didn't pray. Right? He didn't, he didn't pray. <laughs> no single prayer. No. Oh, they have come. In the name of Jesus, fire, 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 fire. And like we see today, 99.9% of the prayers we make when we are scared does not have authority. Right? If, if, you, if, if, if someone who is in aviation is here or a pilot is here, one of the things they will tell you is that one of the things they teach them as students in the aviation school is never to be in panic. So that, that's why you can, you can be on, on, on plane and you're, you're experiencing turbulence, like crazy turbulence, and you're hearing the pilot's voice, he's calm. That's his training because they know they can't fix anything if they are scared. So Smith came down, looked at the devil, said, oh, it's you, the devil. And he went back to sleep. Like the with all, that um, picture of devil you have in your mind with horn looking all scary, he just turned off, and turned off the light and went back to sleep. Then after he went in inside the room, all of a sudden it dawned on him that the devil has scattered the room, and if he's not arranged, it means that he'll be the one to arrange for the devil has scattered. 
So he came back, and the devil had gone when he came back. He came back and said, devil, I command you to come back, and the devil came back. And after he came back, he told him, he said, make sure you rearrange what is scattered. I won't be the one to arrange it for you. And he went back to sleep. And true to what he had said, when he woke the next, mo the next morning, the, his sitting room was fully arranged by the devil. The same devil you are scared of, right? The same devil. Um, I, I'll share another story, right? And these things are, are, are consistent with the, with the scriptures. That's why I'm sharing them, right? Um, what was his name? Um, uh, Brother Higgin you know, of Blessed Memory, you know, was in a, in a vision. Um, when That's when he actually communicated the believer's authority to us, right? He was in a vision with Jesus, and Jesus was speaking, and all of a sudden, the devil came and began to make some very funny sound such that he couldn't hear what Jesus was saying, like face to face. Some of you think because Jesus is in a, G, Jesus is in a place that the, the, you won't have some form of, um, um, uh, what's it called, demonic um, activity going around. If that was the case, the people Jesus healed, the Bible says how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth, who went about healing, um, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So every healing Jesus did, the Bible likened it to an oppression of the devil. But the fact that Jesus was around these people did not stop the devil from, from oppressing them. All that Jesus needed to do was to take his authority to rebuke the devil. Paul was preaching, going around everywhere, and a, de a demon-possessed lady was, was the one announcing him, you know, and after some days, Paul came to himself. Maybe that was when he descended in the spirit that that was a demonic presence speaking. That's the Paul that you read about that, you know, did mighty things in the Bible, in the gospel, communicated the New Testament to us. A demonic person was going around, going around, um, um, uh, Sorry, sorry about that. That was uh, from me. All right. So a demonic um, whatever was moving around with Paul and announcing him. And he didn't stop him. All he needed to do was to rebuke the devil. Remember in the temptation of Jesus, how that Jesus was tempted three times of the devil until the Bible says Jesus told the devil, get thee behind me, and the temptation ceased. So what am I saying in essence? The fact that the presence of God is in a place does not mean that you will not have you won't find some form of demonic presence around them. But they are limited by your authority. That's what the Bible says. If you resist the devil, he would flee. If you don't resist him, he most likely won't flee. Right? So sometimes I have an issue with people who come into a place and the only thing they are sensing is demonic presence. They don't, you, they don't sense the presence of God. Right? You, you could literally be with some people and for a period of 30 days, 90 days you're with them, they're only sensing, oh, there's demon here, there's demonic activity here, there's demonic, there's nowhere you go to, you won't find demonic activity. Even those of you that want to japa, when you get to get to Canada, get to um, uh, Belarus, wherever you want to go to, when you get there, you still find some form of demonic presence in there. You know the one that struck me the most? The Bible says when the sons of God gathered in the book of Job to have a meeting, the devil was there also. It wasn't, it wasn't, you see, we are the ones that think the devil is our problem. God doesn't think that way. The devil cannot be God's problem. As, and as we have heard here several times, you know, the devil is not the opposite of God. The devil is not, you know, what's an opposite? God, devil, no, no. God is, on, is in a different class all by himself, right? So um, what brought us here was, I was trying to explain to us how that, um, what um Sorry, guys. Sorry. I don't know. But I'm sure it won't happen again. All right. So, um, 
by 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 their human strength, they couldn't have done what they did. Smith Wigglesworth couldn't have seen the devil in his own human strength and said, "Go and sleep," and he goes away. All right? He was acting in a derived authority that was not originally his. Now let's run. Um, the source of authority is not dependent on the user, but on the giver. What is left for the user is to have faith and use it. Now, number two, how is authority expressed? How is authority expressed? <clears throat> I said here, authority is expressed through faith-filled words. Let's see Mark 11, verse 12 to 15. Then we'll read um, 20 to 24. Mark 11, 12 to 15. Mark 11, 12 to 15. It says, and on the morrow, this is um, um, a conversation between Jesus and his disciples. It says, and on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. That's Jesus. Jesus was hungry. Right? So there's no need to be to feel condemned if you're hungry. Jesus was hungry when he was on earth. It says, and he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree, fig tree afar off, Having leaves, he came, if happy, he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said, unto it, unto the tree. Right? Now, there's a lot of um, 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 type and shadow kind of thing going on here, but we don't have the time. Because naturally, the fig tree should not have leaves when it does not have fruit. That's the way the fig tree is supposed to grow. But what we see here is that the fig tree had leaves, but had no fruit. So what did Jesus do? Jesus spoke. He, the Bible said he answered and said unto it. Right? I, I, the, the way this thing is written here is as though there was a conversation going. This fig tree spoke to it. And sometimes this is what happens to us. Situation speaks to us, but we don't speak back. This, 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 this is a very typical example. Situation spoke to Jesus. He came and he, ha he had lack. He had no food. That was the situation speaking to him. And the Bible said he answered and said unto it, right? He said, no man eat, um, no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. He didn't speak it in his mind. He spoke it out loud enough for the disciples and they heard it. And he says, and they come, came unto Jerusalem and went into the temple, blah, blah, and all of that. Now, let's read from verse 20. It says, and in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, calling to remembrance, said unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou causest is withered away. And Jesus answering said unto him, have faith in God. Now, the original rendering of this verse actually said, have the faith of God or have the God kind of faith. Now, I would explain what the God kind of faith means because not just explain, Jesus explained what he meant by that, right? He says, have the God kind of faith. Then in the next verse, he now explained how the God kind of faith um, um, operates. But something very, very important for us to know before I explain the God kind of faith to us is the fact that Jesus, after he has spoken to the fig tree, apparently the fig tree did not die. And after Jesus, now I, I did a few notes here before I explain further. It says, number one, I said here, Jesus expressed authority here by cursing the fig tree to die. Number two, he evidently explains to them, okay, I'll, if, I, if I read this now, I'll be going ahead of myself, right? So Jesus, after he spoke to the fig tree, did not see the fig tree die, right? The people didn't see the fig tree die, but Jesus saw the fig tree die in his heart because he had spoken the word and he knew that acting in authority, see, when you speak as someone who has authority, you have to have faith in what you've said, such that even if you don't see the result of what you said, because if the fig tree died when Jesus said it, like physically, if he had died when Jesus said it here, um, the Peter wouldn't come the next day and act surprised that, oh, master, this thing you said should die has died. Apparently, when Jesus spoke that the fig tree should die, right? They looked at the tree and it was still green. Nothing had died, right? The, the fig tree was still, was still looking fresh, like, you know, it was, and they, were, they, they probably would have been looking at themselves like, this man said this thing that it was going to die, but it has not died. Though. So you can imagine, so this, this, is, this is a tree, 
right? This is a tree. They came to the fig tree. For those of you who can see, right? So this, this is a tree. They came to the fig tree and caused it to die. And after they had spoken to the tree, the tree didn't die. So, but after Jesus spoke to it, Jesus knew that the tree had died. So they walked away. You could, you could imagine that they came from here to this point. After they had spoken to, Jesus had spoken to the fig tree, when they were here, you could imagine Peter, Thomas, you know, John, turning back to look like as the fig tree died. But when Jesus spoke at this point, he didn't look back again because he knew that what he had spoken was already a done deal, right? So sometimes in, in, in expressing authority or in speaking words, um, you will realize that sometimes the, the minute you say something is not when you see the result, but you have to have faith in the fact that because I've said this thing in the name of Jesus, that it is done. It is done. So you speak against sickness in your body. You spoke against a negative situation in your family. And you still see that it is still there, still staring you in the face. You know, you don't um, say, ah, oh God. You know, that's what some of us do. You, you prayed about something. And the day you prayed, you were still looking at that thing. The thing is still there, right? You now begin to get worried. Ah, God, well, I prayed now. What happened? I prayed. You see, when you start behaving like that, I've explained this to us before, how that you are like a farmer who plants his seed in the ground. And after three days observes that the, 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 the seed has not started, started yielding fruit, then he uproots the seed back and says, I don't know. But he said, if I plant this thing, it will yield fruit. Then somebody convinces you again, after like one, one year, you plant the seed again. With every removal planting, removal planting, you see that you will not get any results as compared to somebody who plants the seed in the ground and begins to water it, even if it takes him one year watering it. So how do you water it? I was speaking with my wife some days ago, and I was telling her, I said, one of the things we do when we pray in faith or when we exercise authority is that first and foremost, I, I, I always recommend this. Don't pray or take authority against something if you are afraid. Yeah, that's the first thing. Now, when you when you have adverse situations staring in the face, the first thing to do is not to pray. The first thing to do is to reassure your heart by the word of God. Because if you pray when you are scared, you are like that pilot who is trying to control the plane, even though he's scared. He's going to be in a, in a frenzy, like everybody will be in a mess. So the first thing to do is to calm yourself down. When Jesus came before this fig tree, you could imagine he was calm. When he saw the result he saw, he was calm, but he spoke. And after he spoke, it took the next day for the disciples to see the result of what he had said. Now, in that, in that story, Jesus, the minute he spoke that word, knew that the fig tree had died. So if you look at things from the carnal perspective, our pastor spoke today about how that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Our transactions are not carnal. Paul, writing in 2 Corinthians, says, he says, why we look not at the things that are seen, because the things that are seen are subject to change. Or if you read from King James, it says they are temporal, right? But another translation says these things are subject to change. Our reality is in the spirit. So when you speak the word, you have to have faith in the fact that what you have said is done. Why? It is not because of you. You're acting in Jesus' authority. And if nothing says no to Jesus, if you speak in the authority of Jesus, nothing says no to you. Right? So let me read now. We, we read um, um, verse, okay? It says, and Jesus answering said unto them, that when they said, you could imagine they were amazed. They were like, ah, Jesus, this tree you cursed, it has died though. Jesus didn't say, oh, so you see it now. Oh, now you see that I'm a powerful man. No, he was, he was literally pissed with them. He says, he said, and Jesus answering said unto them, have, have, have the God kind of faith. Right? The God kind of faith is not seeing, is believing. Yeah. Right? The God kind of faith is not seeing, is believing. The God kind of faith is believing, is seeing. Someone says, seeing is believing. That's a carnal, um, that's, that's from a carnal mindset. That's a carnal um, deduction. In the Christian faith, believing is seen. It is when we believe that we will see. 
You don't see, then believe. Remember when um, um, in, in John 20, verse 29, when Jesus resurrected from the, from, from the dead, you know, um, the, the, what's it called? Um, after he had appeared to, to them, Thomas was not in the company when Jesus came. So after, when Thomas came and they told him, the master that ha, ha, appeared to us, you know, uh, Jesus, he has appeared, he is alive. He said, no, I won't believe, except I put my hand in his print, put my hand in his side, I will not believe. If you read John 20, verse 29, when Jesus came, Jesus did not commend him for saying, I want evidence before I believe that Jesus is alive. Jesus expected that Thomas would have believed from the words that he said, because he kept on saying, he said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it back, right? Every single time, he says, except the corn of wheat fallen to the ground and died, he, ab he abided alone. Every single thing he said, you know, when, when he told them that they were going to Jerusalem, he, said, he told them that he was, he's going to be committed into the hands of, you know, the, the, the sign dreams and all of that. And after three days, he was going to resurrect again. So Jesus expected that Thomas would have believed what he said. Now, when that thing happened and Thomas said, except I, I see him, I won't believe what you are saying. When Jesus came, Jesus did not say, ah, you are a good, you know, some of you think you're, you're being diligent when you expect to see before you believe. But Jesus didn't commend him. Jesus rebuked him for, 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 for that unbelief. And Jesus said, ah, Toby Osho, who is yes, love? Please check the platform you are on. So you are saying yes, Lord. All right. Now, okay, yes, Lord. Okay, okay, okay. I need to be sure. All right. So Jesus, what was his response? He said, um, because you see, you believe. He says, but blessed are those who do not see, but yet they believe. Let, let, let's read that. Let's read that. <laughs> no, it was important. I had to ask. John 20, verse 29. You can open it and read it, right? So the next time you are saying, except I see my healing, I will not believe I'm healed. This is what Jesus is telling. Jesus is saying, blessed are those who believe, even though they've not seen. That's the life of the... See, I've, I've said this before. You are, you are called a believer. Hmm? <laughs> yeah, you soon. All right. You are called a believer. The, the noun that describes the believer is actually a verb. So you are a believer. I say that again. The noun that um, um, describes a Christian is actually a verb. You are called a believer. So if you are not believing God, if you are saying, I will only believe when I see, Jesus is saying in John 20, verse 29, that it is a more blessed place to believe even though you have not seen. Why do you believe even though you have not seen? It's because you know this is what the word of God says and you are going to hold on to it. Now, Jesus tells them, very important here, Jesus tells them, have the God kind of faith. Then in the next verse, he comes to, he then describes what the God, God kind of faith looks like. Let's read, 23 and 24. It says, we're, we're back to Mark um, 11. 23 and 24, it says, for verily, verily, I say unto you. Now, remember, the Bible is a, a contextual book, right? So if Jesus says, have the God kind of faith or have the God, God, yeah, God kind of faith, um, not have faith in God, right? The right rendering means have the faith of God. Yeah, that's that's what I was looking for. Have the faith of God or have the God kind of faith. Then in the next verse, it comes to explain what the God kind of faith or how the God kind of faith operates. The God kind of faith, he said, for verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he said shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. The description then comes in verse 24. It says, Therefore I say unto you that what things soever ye desire, when ye pray, believe that ye receive them and ye shall have them. Now, let me, let me, let me explain something here. You only believe for something you're not seeing. You've not seen with your physical eyes. Now, I can't believe that this um, light is with me. You know why? It is here. If I say, I believe in the name of Jesus, this light is here. So all you need to do is to tap me and say, bro, see, the light is here. There's no need for you to be believing or be hoping for, for that, right? Believing comes into play when you don't see. So Jesus says, when you speak to the mountain and say, be thou removed and be cast into the sea, 
He said you have to believe that what you have said is done. So the reason why he's saying you have to believe is most likely because when you spoke to this mountain, the mountain didn't go physically. It didn't go. When you spoke to that difficult situation, it didn't leave physically. When you spoke to that, that sickness, right? You say I'm healed in the name of Jesus. And sometimes the shocking part is after you have said I'm healed, if, if there's anybody here who have experienced this, right? Just signify by wave of hand. You say I'm healed in the name of Jesus. And you were feeling better before you prayed. And after praying, the sickness gets worse. Right? Or you, you are applying for a contract and you are believing God. You are believing God. The man that was supposed to award you the contract was already talking to you nicely. Then after you prayed, you came back the next day and he told you, I don't want to see your face. Remember, when Moses, when Moses um, went to Egypt, right, after God sent him, to, to um, deliver the people of, um, um, of um, the Jews out of the hand of Pharaoh. The Bible said that after Moses spoke to Pharaoh, Pharaoh now made the attacks. Yeah? He made it worse than how it was. So they were first under bondage, but after they came and said, it is that God has said, after 430 years, we're supposed to leave slavery. Now it's time to let my people go that they may go and serve me. This, the problem now increased. But what you need to know, and this is very important, is that what changes is not the word of God. I tell someone sometimes, you know, after you pray, and I, I, I've seen this happen several times. Somebody prays a prayer, and after praying the prayer, things get worse, and he's worried. I'm like, no, the word of God did not change in, in the whole of that transaction. What you are banking on, what you are holding on to is God's word, right? What you are believing on is God's word. And you need to be con you need to be you need to be disciplined to understand that even though your situation is roaring, is shouting like Peter, you know, if it is if it is you, bid me to come. And Jesus said, Come. The word Jesus gave him did not change. What changed was Peter's belief, right? The circumstances, the wind was boisterous even before he came down. But the minute he took his eyes off the word of God, off what God has said concerning him. He began to sink, even though he was not supposed to sink. So when you are believing God for something, when you are acting on, in authority, like I said here, authority is expressed via words. Authority is expressed via words. I've said this over and over again. When the COVID-19 broke out in Nigeria, all that, the, if the president had not said anything, everybody, there, there wouldn't have been a lockdown. But the minute he came and said, there's a lockdown, the lockdown automatically happened. All that we needed to do, all that they needed to do was to ensure that there were law enforcers around town to ensure that the words that had been spoken were adhered to. So if you are not speaking, eh, not this, not this. Many of you are going through situations that you are hoping would change. The Bible, Jesus is telling you that how you make the mountain to leave you how you make how you rebuke the mountain is by speaking authority is expressed via words i'll say it again authority is expressed via words and god said and god said and god said that was at creation right everything god created aside man he created by words that was his authority being expressed there he spoke these things into existence. And God is saying, Jesus is saying to us that the same way God ex exercises authority via words, right? And he spoke, he took a day, this, the light, for the light to come. And he took, he took, it might take a while, but eventually the, the light came. He says, let the waters be divided from the land. It might take a while, but eventually, they eventually came. But he had faith in what he had said. This is the relationship between faith and authority. He had faith that his authority was, was strong enough to, for his words to actualize what he had said it would, it, would, it would actualize. So if you're sitting in a bad situation and you're just hoping it will go, you need to speak, speak. Don't close your mouth. Don't, Jesus says, if you speak to the mountain, God knows the mountain needs to leave you. But yet he's saying, if you speak. So meaning that the, the, the how soon the mountain leaves is dependent on how you are able to speak. So you don't keep quiet on life. The authority that God has given to you is invested in your mouth. Jesus spoke to the fig tree and he died. Then he says that 
you, you should have the God kind of faith. And how does the God kind of faith? The God kind of faith operates by speaking to the mountain. And, and it says, when you speak, have no doubt in your heart. See, I, I'm trying to, even if I stop here, right? We're supposed to stop by 7.45 before I take questions. Even if I stop here, I have a lot I wanted to share. But even if I stop here, I, I, I prefer we take our time and um, teach things properly than rush over them and you don't get the point. Now, let's, let's sit down on Mark 11 again. All right, let's sit down here. It says, for, for verily I say unto you that what's, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, there's a mountain. Let me bring back um, this. There's a mountain. It says, if you say unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea and shall not doubt in your heart. Now, see, if when I said mountain, be thou removed, and the mountain left, you know I won't have doubt. Can, can anybody hear me? I, I need to be sure we're following, right? If, if, yeah, yes, sir. yeah, yeah, right? So yes. if when I said mountain, be that removed, the mountain left immediately, I won't have doubt in my heart. There's no, there's, there, I can't have doubt if I say, Mountain, be that and the mountain left. I'll say, oh, glory, the, the mountain has left. But Jesus says, you say unto this mountain, be that removed and cast into the sea. And you don't doubt in your heart. Meaning that at the time you're saying it, there's every possibility that the mountain is staring you in the face. But Jesus says, don't have doubt. The fact that you are seeing this thing here does not mean it's still there. If you said in faith that mountain be that removed, it has left. What you are seeing is something that is in his passing face. This is the reason why many of us are frustrated when it comes to acting in authority. I've said this before, and I'm, I'm, I feel the spirit of God, you know, keeping me here for a while to explain this to us. This is the reason why many of us are frustrated when it comes to expressing authority. So you said, um, 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 Ma a mountain leave in the name of Jesus and you are looking, it's still there. It's a mountain leave in the name of Jesus and you are looking, it's still there. It's a mountain leave. The, the fact that you are waiting to see the mountain leave before you believe it has left is a proof that you don't believe that what you have said has, has worked. And as long as you keep acting like that, you, you won't see the result you're supposed to get. So Jesus says, the mountain is still in the face. He says, you don't have doubt in your heart. Don't. Don't have doubt in your heart. Believe that what you have said is settled. And because you believe, just like Jesus, if you come back after a while, for sometimes, you know, nobody can explain theologically why some issues, some challenge stays longer than the other. All you need to do is stay consistent, stay on God's word. This is what God says concerning that thing. Stay there. I've explained to us how that... Um, I, I, I wrote, I, when I wrote Jam, you know, over 400, I saw 45 or so. Yeah, 45. You know, I, I went, I said, hey, this is not my result. And I, 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 I believed God. It took me after two weeks for me to go and check. But I believed God that the next time I was going to come back to check, that in two weeks' time, that was actually what I said. I said, in two weeks' time, I'll come back to check this in. And by that time, my results would have been upgraded. And it went from a, two, uh, a, a 45 to a 235 or so. You have to stay consistent, not believing, not wishful thinking. What does the word of God say about the situation? So my situation is not in alignment with what, God, what, what God's word says, but I'm going to stay here until that which God has said over the situation eventually plays out. Because God is not a man that he should lie, neither is he the son of man that should have repent. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 12, he says, I'm watching over my word to see it fulfilled. I'm watching. God is literally watching over his word to ensure that every, he said, the word that comes out of his mouth, he said, it will not return to him void. He said, just like the rain falls on the earth and everywhere is cool, like the dew falls on the earth and you can see the impact. So it is with his word. Every word that has gone out of God's mouth will not return to him void. And if you stay on it, believe it in, in, in faith, with the authority in the name of Jesus. I mean, we're explaining this before. We don't have the time today to explain the principle behind in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus means in the authority of Jesus. All right. 
So waiting on seeing before believing is not a good example or good usage of the faith of God in you. So authority is expressed through faith-filled words. I repeat, authority is expressed through faith-filled words. Number two, you must have faith in what you have said if authority is to be communicated. Have you seen somebody give you an instruction before and the person is not sure? The person is saying, um, you most likely won't take the person seriously. But when you see somebody who tells you, do this, do that, do that, do that, you, you say the person is an authority in what he's doing. You want to respond to the person. It's the same thing, right? When it comes to situation, casting out devils, you know, addressing situations, you have to have, if you are a born again believer, uh, please note this. If you are not a believer, this thing will not work for you. So if you are a believer, you can say to the devil, be rebuked and the devil will go. These are not things that we're just saying. We have every, this, this should be every believer's experience. You say, devil, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you. And he leaves. You don't even need to shout. Devil, I rebuke you. Forget these things you see in African magic where someone is carrying Bible. Hey, in the name of Jesus. Hey. See, I, I'm of the opinion that African, when, when we leave um, the description of spiritual things to people who are not exactly spiritual, what you will get is a, an abuse of spiritual realities. So somebody carries the carries Bible, you know, is with, with the herbalist. He carries his Bible like, like this, is, this is shield of faith, right? So some, the herbalist says, uh, and throws one light, and the person uses his Bible, and you push it away. You know, is is a mess. Is a mess. Where well, you have to quote seventeen scriptures, you have to do um, Bible study. You know, you have to be quoting. It, it is written. It is written. I, 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 You have to be quoting. How many times did you see Jesus quoting, quoting different Bible? And these things, these things affects us. It does. It affects us. Right. Some of us think we have to quote like twenty scriptures before the devil would see. No. Do you know who you are? That's all you need. With one word, the, the devil flees. If it were not so, God would, would have told you so. Right? No, number three, um, we'll look at the scope of authority. I think this is where we'll stop. Okay, I, I said, God and the devil need our mouth. Please note this. God and the devil needs our mouth. If words were not important, we will not, will not be tempted to speak negative when we are angry or in doubt. How many of you, anytime you are, maybe after you finish praying, you're believing God for something, um, all of a sudden, you know, doubt comes in. Now, you would always see, right? Please, I, I love to get witness if what I'm saying is correct. <clears throat> you would always see that anytime you're in doubt, you're always tempted to speak. How many of you, you're here, you've experienced that before. You're, 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 maybe you're believing God for healing. Um, you're believing God for healing and you prayed. You thought you had faith. Then after like, like 30 minutes, the thing has not gone. Majority of the times, it doesn't stop with you just observing in your heart that thing has not gone. You will say it with your mouth that, ah, this thing has not gone. It is at that point of confessing it, right? That you, what you don't know is that the devil needs your mouth as much as God needs your mouth. God needs your mouth to change your situation. The devil also needs your mouth to enslave you. So that's why the, at the end of every doubt is a negative word because the devil wants you to be ensnared by the things you're going to say. So there's authority here. Just use it rightly. We don't have time. We would have read, but please note this. First Peter 3 verse 10. First Peter 3 verse 10. First Peter. It says, he that loves good, um, he, that, he that loves um. I think let's let's read let's read that. Let's read that. Let's read that. It's very important. Let's read that. First Peter 3, verse 10. If you are there before me, you can read. If you are there before me, you can read. First Peter 3, verse 10. If you have, if you can unmute yourself, do well to read. Um, okay. No one is there. First Peter 3, the first 10, it says, For he that will love life, do you love life? It says, He that will love life and see good days, 
let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lip, his lips that they speak no guile. He says, if you love good life, you love life, you want to enjoy life, you want to enjoy life to the fullest and be all that God wants you to be. He says, control your mouth. That's, I'm not the one that's saying it, it's in the Bible, control your mouth. Because um, authority works. Mm. All right, let, let me, because, because of time, let me quickly condense the other one I wanted to, uh, um, the um, negative things. I, I might share this, um, um, uh, the note on this with us, I might share it with us so that we can take our time. That's if we read it, right? So that we can take our time and read the other parts that uh, we won't have the time to share. Now, let me quickly condense two things in one here now. Now that we're talking about authority being expressed in mouth, um, um, through words, it's also important for you to know that the authority that is being expressed through words is both positive and negative. Uh, I need to put, push this in, right? Um, our pastor said it today, right? He said that eventually the devil needs your authority to enslave you, right? So that's why at the end of every doubt, at the end of every fear, is a negative word. The devil is pushing you to confess something because he needs what you're going to say to enslave you. So authority is not only at, in play when you when you are confessing God's word. That's why a spiritual man, see, how I know, one of the, one of the indicators for me of a, of a very spiritual person is they don't talk too much. If you see someone, Nigeria is a stupid, Nigeria is family is most like, you don't understand the power in your phone. You see, men of authority don't talk anyhow because they know that everything they say is law. You know, if there, there's a joke, the president of Nigeria will crack now on Twitter and problem would, would, would come out. Just one joke. Yeah, and the damage the thing would have created would have been so much that when he now comes back to say, I was just joking, you know, some persons would have perished from that joke. So you don't confess negatively, whether you are joking or not. That's why I don't have, there are certain things I won't take, right, as a joke, I won't. You say, ah, you, say, ah, you don't die, right? Say, ah, mumu, you know, you're, you know, ever get sense, and you are laughing. Eh? You are laughing. More so is a believer saying those things, and he says he's just joking. That's not, that's not joke. There's, 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 the Bible says there's power of life and death in the tongue. It's not just life. You have the tendency to use it for life and use it for death, depending on the words you choose to use. So if you come around me and you're making such nasty jokes, you say, ah, you, you know, ever get sense for this life. I will, I will correct you in love. I will correct you in love. It doesn't matter who the person is. Like nobody. If it is somebody who is such an authority figure that I cannot speak to directly. As you're saying, if you just see my mouth is moving, I'm, I'm canceling what you're saying. I won't take it. Right? Um, um, um. I can't remember, somebody was carrying, carrying my son and he said, she said something, he, yeah, said something very nasty, all in the spirit of joke. I corrected him immediately. There's no joke. There's power of life and death in your tongue. So you don't allow loose words out of your mouth. Ah, we don't have time. Number three, we can, we can only take three um, points for today. Number three, the scope of authority. And I'll just rush through this so that we just note them. So that you don't go exercising authority over something you don't have authority over. Now, the scope of a believer's authority. The following are the things we have authority over. Number one is that we have authority over the devil. James chapter 4 verse 7 says, it says, resist the devil and he will flee. The, um, number two is that we have authority a, over negative situations. You, you shall speak to this mountain and... Be that removed, Matthew 17, verse 20, right? So you have authority over the devil. You have authority over negative situations. Number three is that you have authority over your home as um, the man of this house. I have authority over this house, right? No matter how highly spiritual you are, if you speak something in this house that I am not in agreement with, I would cancel it because I'm the one God has 
place in this and I have authority over this house. I have authority over my children, right? They can't make decisions and all that. I can stand in authority for them. So you must understand that there, is, there are jurisdictions to these things. God didn't give you authority over the whole world. If that were to be the case, you'd be the one controlling people's marriages, people's finance, people's everything. And God will not such. Even God has authority over everybody, but he doesn't use it. He still allows you to do what you want to do. Hmm? I, I, was, I was cracking a joke with someone and I, I told the person, I said, if some of us, you know, had got like, if, like legit now, right? If you had the ability from praying, you can disappear and appear. Some of you will disappear inside a, a central bank, pack all the dollars and appear in your house. You know, so because I these people who are, yeah, yeah, and it's the truth. You know, these people, these people, <laughs> so we said glory. There's no glory in this, <laughs> you know, because that would be theft. That's somebody's money you are taking. You know, someone, someone says, you know, that you can teleport. You can go. I, I, I say, even if that reality is such that is possible, you know, supernaturally, God will not even give you because you have lost issues. You just teleport into someone's house and steal all the person's goods and teleport back to your house. So some of the things we are asking for, James says, you ask and do not receive because you ask and miss. You are asking to satisfy your loss. That's why you're asking. You know? Now, three things we do not have authority over. You don't have authority over God. Says, command me, command the Lord. No, you don't have authority over God. He's God. Hmm? All of us are all limited by God's will for our lives. So that's why there's nothing you can do to, that will make God change his plan over you. Number two, you don't have authority over angels. Psalm 90 says, it says, show me. Psalm 91, verse 11 says, He will give his angels charge. God is the one that commands his angels. They have been assigned unto you as ministering spirits, but they, every single time, not this, every single time you read in the Bible that someone had an angelic encounter, they had a specific message to pass across. And once they are done, they are gone. You can't tell them, um, angel, even though I know that God sent you here to and send to deliver this message to me. Can you please help me go to the market and buy cornflakes, buy milk? That's not part of his assignment. Angels are God's agents. They are sent to you. It's like, it's like um, you have a child and you have servants working for you or you have workers working for you. If you attach someone to one of your children, if you attach a driver to your children, they, they take instructions from you, right? So if I say, driver, take my child to school. And why is they on the road? The driver says, the, the child says, I don't want to go to school. I don't want to go to school. Take me to Babbage. And he takes the child to Babbage. I will fire him. Because he shouldn't take instructions from the child. He's under my pay, right? So that's, that's, then the third one, and I'll stop here, is that, you don't have authority over your fellow man. You don't. Hmm? Yeah, you don't have authority over your fellow man. If you read um, Genesis chapter 1, I think verse 26, there about, when God um, created Adam, it says, and he gave him dominion over everything he created. God did not even give Adam dominion over Eve. Now, for some of you, this is some deliverance for you now. Because some of you want to marry a woman that will, you will shape, you will mold, you have a picture in your mind, you tell her where to sit, you tell her where to go. She literally becomes a robot. And it's not just on the, uh, on, on the male side, it's also on the, women, uh, on the female folk. Some of you ladies, you want to marry a man that you just control his life completely. You tell him when to wake up, you tell him when to sleep, you tell him when to send money to his family, you tell him everything, just want to direct his life. God did not give you authority over your fellow man. He gave you authority, he gave Adam authority over everything he created, but the woman was not included. That 
a very vital piece of information that I think we should have. We couldn't take, if God is good, why is negativity the outcome of some exercise of, of authority? We couldn't take what authority, what authority does the devil have over the believer? We couldn't take, does the believer have authority over the devil? We couldn't take, where does the believer's authority derive from? We couldn't take, okay, we've already talked about the place of faith in the authority of the believer. I, if we would read it, I would send my note to us so that we can go through, especially um, what authority does the, believe, does the devil have over the believer? That's a very important place that I think um, anyone who is reading through this, you must read. You must read. Um, like our pastor said, I, if we had the time, I would have explained um, the, the wiles, right? The tools. Let me just say this, that every um, adventure in the flesh is an avenue given over to the devil to direct our lives. The devil does not have authority over you, but he will use your will against you. So every and anything that is not in the spirit, right? Galatians chapter 5, verse 6 or 16 says, it says, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the loss of the flesh. Everything that is fleshy is you giving the devil a right to act in your life, all right? Um, he doesn't have authority over you, but he can use anger. He can use bitterness. He can use doubting God's word. He can use... Um, um, Backbiting. If you read Galatians 5, verse 14 to 20, right? Um, you can use idolatry, you can use hatred, you can use variance, the division, emulations, wrath, um, strife, sedition, heresies, envying, rivaling, drunkenness, murders. He can use it against you, but he doesn't have authority against you. So if you understand the wise of the devil, note this: if you understand the wise of the devil you will always be victorious over him. The reason why some believers are defeated by the devil is because they don't understand the wiles of the devil. When he, sells, when he sells bitterness in your heart against somebody, you think you have a legitimate reason to have all that bitterness, but that's an inroad that you have given him into your life. Like our pastor said today, uh, Ephesians 4, that's verse 27, say, give no place to the devil. So actually talking about our anger, not allowing anger in your heart because if you allow anger in your heart what you will produce will not be the fruit of the spirit it will be the works of the flesh amen praise god praise god praise god all right i'll take questions if we have any um just quick quick quickly quickly let's take questions if we have any can 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 People unmute their mics if they want to talk, or do they have to um, type? I think you can unmute. All right. All right. Does anybody have any question? I have a okay. question. Okay. okay. Oh, sorry, please introduce yourself first. Okay. My name is Adenike. All right. Okay. My question is this. Um, the part that you mentioned that we don't have authority um, over man. Yeah. So in situations where, um, let's say, for example, you have somebody that is oppressing you at work or something, yeah. like maybe a boss or something, yeah. and, and the only thing you can do is go in prayer, like call the person's name, because I've experienced something like that before. Like they say, ah, if you're, okay, your boss is um, disturbing you okay go to god in prayer and you know yeah. you mentioned the person saying ah you this guy i don't want you to have anything against my work or anything yeah. anymore yeah. so yeah. and <laughs> you know things happen or the person just adjust back yeah. to normal instead of being yeah. an oppressor or something yeah. so is that that kind of authority we don't have against man or okay. is there any other context aside that okay that's all right all right thank you that's i actually um anticipated that question and it's good it came up now you don't have authority over man now the bible says for we wrestle not against what flesh and blood right what does flesh and blood mean nike 
sir. Yeah. Human beings. Human beings. Yes, human beings. That's what it means. So if the Bible says we wrestle yes. not against flesh and blood, it means we are not wrestling against human beings. What you are wrestling against, spirits, you know, mindset. So what happens? Nobody does anything um, in isolation. People do things because they are inspired by something. So the right, now sometimes truth be told is as much as it is good for us to um, know things rightly, no right doctrine, sometimes there are people who don't know the right thing, but pray and God answers the intent of their heart and not what they're saying, right? So the right application, the right way to pray that prayer is actually because if someone is oppressing you, there is a spirit that is influencing that person to do that thing. So what you are doing is that you're rebuking the influence of the devil over that person's heart that is pushing that person to do what the person is doing. Because clearly, it's clear, Bible says you do not have any wrestle against a human being. A human being in himself or herself is not your enemy. But people become your enemy when they expose themselves to wrong spirits. Then they become an issue to you. Even you, there are certain things that the Spirit of God has changed your mind about. Sometimes it took a while, right? Even there, there might be somebody here now who the Spirit of God is trying to change your mind over something and he has not been able to succeed yet in your heart, right? It's, it's like in, in, in the book of um, uh, Revelations, he sees standing at the, at the door of your heart knocking. If he is the Lord of your life, he shouldn't even be at the door. He should be in there, right? So back to what I was saying. Um, you, the right way to pray that prayer actually will be that in an, I rebuke every influence of the devil that is holding this person's heart against me in the name of Jesus. You probably get quicker results than praying, praying against the person. So like I said, there are times you pray that thing and say, in the name of Jesus, um, um, Muftal, you have been troubling me, boss, Muftal, M uh, MD, Muftal, Muftal, or Jedi Ron, you have been, I don't know who that is. And just in case there's anybody here, I don't, I just mentioned um, a name, right, that came to my heart. So Muftal, or Jedi Ron, in the name of Jesus, I command you, um, stop disturbing me, and the person stops. What stopped is not the person. What stopped is the influence that is holding that person against you. So clearly, like I said, the Bible has already explained that we do not have um, any wrestle against any human being. Somebody does something, is it, either the person is influenced. A good example, Jesus was going to die. And Peter said, after he, Jesus had told them that I'm going to leave and all of that, Peter said, Oga, don't say that thing again. What did Jesus do? Jesus did not rebuke Peter. He said, I, um, um, what was that thing he said? He rebuked the devil. Spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he rebuked the spirit that was speaking yeah. through Peter. So you get a faster result actually because one of the, uh, in spiritual warfare, what is concealed is not easily conquered. You see, um, if you've ever done any casting of, of devils and all of that, you know, the, um, um, and all of that in, in people, you will realize that some persons, like one of the experiences I had, um, so, well, I was praying or something, and it was a line where uh, laying hands on people and all of that. And all of a sudden, one of the ladies who was there was actually, I just had that um, word of knowledge that this person actually came here for negative reasons. So I just looked at her and I said, um, you came to try me. And that was all. She started, you know, scattering the whole place, you know. So in spiritual um, um, warfare and all of that, what is concealed is not easily defeated. So if you catch the devil, is a, a thief. The strength of every thief is in being hidden. That's why most times, most times, right, thieves go in the night, right? So if he is caught, just imagine somebody walks into your house, the person wants to see that, and you say, ah, uh, brother Jeremiah, the person is wearing a mask. I say, ah, brother Jeremiah, I see you. I know you are the one. See, the whole strength in the person to steal from you is gone. Right? That's why even when the devil wants to come against you, he, he morphs himself as an angel of light because he does not want to be caught. Right? So you get faster, a quicker result if you address the spirit that is 
um, influencing that. Sometimes it can be the spirit of envy, the spirit of wrath, the spirit of, and all of that, right? Devil, they disguise, oh my brother, like we were, they disguise us a whole lot, right? So that's, that's where that prayer should be channeled on, not against the person, because the Bible says that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Is that, Nikki, did I answer your question? Yes, yes. Thank you. Very well, thank you. Any other question? We can take two more if there are any. Yes. So, Pastor Ansem, thank you for the teaching this evening. Thank, thank you, you for this class. It has been very enlightening and insightful. I do hope that we'll be able to get the recording because, honestly, sir, the particular point that you were on about. Uh, authority and how we need to exercise it by the use of words and all that and all that it was really very insightful thank you so much i would like thank to you. ask me regarding the fact that we cannot give um the, regarding the fact that we cannot exercise authority over the angels so yeah. how do we reconcile that with maybe some of the prayer points or some of the things we've been taught in the past that says maybe something like okay I'm going out to evangelize now. Or oh, okay, no, let's not even use it. Sorry, who, who is name. talking? This voice sounds familiar, though. JJ. Okay, JJ. Yeah. JJ. Okay, so, <laughs> so let's not use a spiritual example. Let's use a natural one. Something along yeah. the lines of okay, angels of God. I'm going out this morning now. Uh, the angels that are assigned to me um, to take care of the road lead me to where to pass through and all that don't yeah. ensure that there's no traffic in my way blah blah yeah. blah blah so yeah. how do we reconcile the fact that we cannot issue directive to angels with what you said that we all don't right. have authority over them thank you all right thank you now um first is let me let me um, address something there is there is a there is a terrible situation in the body of Christ where people are more confident in angels than the spirit of God. I'll explain. If I come now and I say, you know, as I'm teaching, I'm teaching by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, right? Um, if I come now and I say, there's an angel, um, um, Toby, there's an angel sitting by your side. Naturally, and we're all like that, right? <laughs> Naturally, you'll be like, hey, you know, you'll not be. For the Holy Ghost has been with you all the while. And God promised you the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. You say, hi, angel, <laughs> right? What God promised you is the comforter, not angel. Many of us want to, want to be led, want to be guided by angel. It is the comforter that Jesus said he would send and he would lead us into all through truth. So it first is, is not part of your question, but I want to address this. Be confident in the presence of the Holy Ghost in your life. The Bible says that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. So you shouldn't be more confident if someone says, okay, as you are traveling now, I dispatch a battalion of angels. We hear that a lot, right? You say, I dispatch a battalion of angels to go with you. Listen, if, the, if angels are not with you, and you have the Holy Spirit, you are safe. Hmm? But those guys are foot soldiers, right? Right, you said. Now, secondly is, angels that are assigned to you are assigned to keep you safe. So whether you pray that they should clear the road and ensure that nothing bad happens and all that, there is already a stand. It is not what you are saying at that time. Just imagine, right? Think with me, right? Think with me. Just imagine that the only things angels do for you are what you command them to do. How many things do you know happens around you? If everything angels does for you are things that, because it's only when you see danger, you can now say, okay, angel, go on. Hmm? If everything the angel does are the things you command them to do, how much do you know? What do you see? Are you even seeing what's going on around you right now? You don't. So the end, it, it is not your command that is keeping you safe. It is 
the, the Bible says, he has given his angel charge over you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. That thing actually means so that you don't hurt yourself, so that you don't come into peril, you don't come into destruction. That is what is keeping you safe, not the command that you are giving, right? But beyond that, like I said at first, is we must be confident in the presence of the Holy Ghost in our lives more than if you have angelic in, uh, uh, angelic in encounters, that's beautiful, right? Um, they, they, there was a time I used to pray, Lord, Lord, I want to see angels, I want to see angels. And one of the questions the, the Spirit of God will ask me is, is there anything the angel will say that is different from what I'm already saying? If the angel comes now, right, it is still words the person will communicate to you. If there is this supernatural encounter you're supposed to have and all of that, it, you will have it when God wants you to have it. Right, so um, angels, you, you need to know like God to command angels for you to be safe. And because you don't know, uh, Paul says we, we know in part, right? We, right now we're on earth, we know in part. But when we see him, we shall know as he knows. Mm -hmm. So man, even the most spiritual man does not have the whole picture. So if God has to depend on your intelligence to direct angels, then everybody's in a mess. Everybody will just... We just kill ourselves, right? <clears throat> because sometimes you say, angel, go and block that road. And the road that you are saying the angel should go and block is where your destiny helper is going to pass to come and meet you. You see now, you have caused problem. You know, by fixing one problem, you have now created a bigger problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, yeah. All right, so, JJ, I'm sure that answered your question. I'm seeing your reaction. Yes, one last question. Yes, All right, you. thank you. One last question, if there's any. Good evening, One last Pastor Flynn. Good evening. Yes, I, okay, I just want to ask that. Sorry, your name. How, okay, my name is Aureolua. Aureolua, all right. Yes, so I just want to ask that, how do you um, resist authority from, or I don't know how to put it, but how do you resist um, the authority from, uh religious pastors when they say stuff like um i see over you something 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 and they they want you like they want to use their authority as a pastor to subject you to their own doctrinal beliefs in the sense that they'll tell you um i i see something over your life or over your family and all that especially in the sense when um someone like that is probably um related to you more like more than a family um more than a pastor like a family friend also okay, but okay. the person also also has like a ministerial or what, what what but you guys don't have the same um belief okay so how do you resist such authorities and also in terms of um the the question the lady earlier raised about um what if your boss is oppressing you with the authority they have so what kind of prayers so i remember then that i was oppressed at work too and i i the, the prayer i prayed for them was that um that god would just um expose them to the true message um because they were also christians but that god will reveal them or expose them to the true message of christ mm -hmm. uh, but i I'm not sure if the prayer was answered or so because I still ended up being fired. So okay. I, I don't know if that was a good prayer enough. So that, that's my okay. question. <clears throat> All right, we'll take it one after the other. I'll, I'll try. Then. <clears throat> the first one is, um, please remind me again. All right. Okay, the first one is how do you resist the authority of a good. religious leader? Like yeah. you want to impose authority over you. Yeah. All right. So, um, a, a very good example is I. So first, let me say this: that a, any prophecy that is received from a supposed pastor or minister of the gospel that communicates fear to your heart is not. <clears throat> it may be a right revelation, but it was wrongly communicated. Because um, every time angels, if you read the Old Testament or so. Even in the New Testament, every time you, anybody has an encounter with angels, the first thing they say is fear not, right? Because God has not given you the spirit of fear, right? So what I've observed is that, yeah, that's, that's now, the reason why they do this fear part is that they want you to sow seed. 
or uh, you, you can confirm, right? Believe exactly. That? Yeah, that's that's why they want you to. So see, the devil is always planning bad against you. You don't understand. First, first Peter chapter five verse eight says, "Be sober, be vigilant, because yeah, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeketh whom he may devour." So the devil is always looking for who to devour. The devil is always planning, wanting to destroy people, right? Yeah, it says so dangerous captivity, turning seed. Just JJ is like you have experienced this people a whole lot, right? So, uh, <laughs> right. So, but it didn't stop there. The first part, verse verse eight, talks about what the devil is planning to do. Verse nine says, "Who resist steadfast in the faith." So resisting the devil has nothing to do with sowing seed. Has nothing to do with sowing seed. All you just need to do is just place your faith. Like I said, use your words. Where, where is it written in the Bible that if you are in danger, God says the way to abat it is by sowing seed. And these people are very creative. We get stuff like sow a seed, like JJ said, sow a, 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 a captivity turning around seed of... Seven thousand seven hundred and seventy-seven dollars. The number seven 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 is the number of perfection, and they'll tell you it's a spiritual instruction. Watch them most times. That spiritual instruction they received in your church, they've also received it in over twenty-seven churches. I know a, a pastor. There's no time I see him preach. He must end up with seed. Like there's nothing. Not if he, if he teaches on justification by faith. At the end of the, the this thing, he will cause seed. And the, the terrible thing about it is that some persons have sowed the last time and their life did not change. So the next time he comes back to that job to raise seed again, everybody's angry. A very good example, uh, myself and my wife, um, see that's anointing. Myself and my wife went for a program where then we're not married, right? So a prophet came for the meeting, right? So next thing he called out my wife, you know, told her, described the jeep that my wife's dad uses, you know, told my wife that um, uh, her, her dad wants to travel to the east and was going to build in the village, you know, that he's traveling on social and so he accurately he got everything accurately, but that if he travels with that car, now this is the problem, if he travels with that car, that he will not come back, that you have an accident on the, on the road. That what we should do is that we should sow a seed of, we should um, get a, a cash equivalent of, I think, seven bags of rice. That that's what will avert the danger. So I sat down and I said, so if we don't, if we don't give you, is it, it, it looks like a native doctor's operation, right? So if we don't give God notes now, if we don't give God seven bags of rice, he will not avoid danger. That's how wicked we think God is. So if the person doesn't sow the seed, now what you what you observe sometimes is that they tell people these things and they don't do it and eventually they die. It is not that God wanted them to die. It was fear that was communicated to them. Because like we've learned over and over again, faith is you believing in God's ability. Fear is believing in the devil's outcome. So if you have, because when these things are communicated to you and you are scared, you now say, ah, because I don't have the money for seven bags of rice. Ah, ah that's, that means they meet it all. Ah, they meet it all. Eventually it happens. When it happens, it's not God. The minister partnered with the devil to bring about that outcome. Right? So, the first thing to do when you hear things like, there's nothing you tell me now. Huh? There's nothing. Uh, some people even borrow to get the seed because the man of God has spoken. And if he does, does think, does think that your son, I have a son by the grace of God, my son wants to run into danger. I will not see that he's entering danger. I will tell him, okay, Josh, if for you not to enter that danger, sow a seed of 250,000 naira. And if Josh does not bring the money, I will allow him to enter the danger. Ah, ah, how is that a good God? How is that a good God? The, the truth sets free. The truth sets free. That you see your son running into danger. 
you are allowing him because he did not give you seed. The pastor who is supposed to just rebuke the devil is waiting. That thing he's looking for is the father's venison. <laughs> That's, uh, you know, those guys were not perfect guys. Will not go there, right? Those guys were not perfect. The man who said, give me venison that I may bless you because he wants to die. He still stayed several years before he died. Several years before he died. Right? So, all right, um, the way to go about it is reassure your heart with God's word. I I've said this before. I was driving one of these. I was coming to church on my way to church. Myself, my wife, and one other person were in the car. And I heard a voice. If you, if you don't know God, you think that's the spirit of God talking to you. I heard a voice, very still, small voice, say, you are about to have an accident now. That was what the voice told me. And my brethren, I looked left, looked right. If I have an accident, there's every tendency that is inside the, is on top of Todd Milan, right? Is inside the water. Wah. So when that thing came, you know, I, <laughs> you know what I did? I, I started asking myself, I said, what part of you have an accident is captured in your going out and your coming in is blessed? Is accident a blessing? What part of you, you're about to have an accident now it, um, 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 contains if you give an, his angels charge over you, lest you dash your feet against any stone. If God will not want me to dash my feet against stone, is it accident you allow me to have? What part of um, you, you, um, um, no, the rod of the wicked will not, will not rest upon the lot of the righteous? What part of no weapon from the passion against you shall, shall prosper? Every tongue that rests up against you, judgment, you shall condemn. I began to quote the scriptures. I began, and eventually, I just laughed. I, I, I laughed the devil off. I laughed him off. I, 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 heard, I heard of a story. It's too, it's too good not to share, right? Three things. One, three people had the same dream. One slept in the night and he was shot in the dream. Now, let's, let's take note of this. Three people. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is so that we don't take things for granted. When you hear things like this, reassure your heart and confess the word and rebuke the devil. Three things I'm saying here. One, when you hear negative news, know that anything that sells fear into you is not God's will. It may be a right revelation, but if it sells fear into your heart, it is doing the devil's job. Revelation from God revealing what the devil is doing, if it sells fear into you, it is what it is now doing that is now doing the devil's job, not God's job any longer. Because every time God communicates to you, he wants to communicate faith to you. Faith, that's what God wants to communicate to you. So three people had one dream, right? One man slept in the night and he saw somebody shoot him in the dream, right? Shoot him on his side. And when he woke, when he woke up the next morning, he died, right? He died from, because he was feeling pain. Ah, 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 and he died. The second person had the same dream. He was shot and he felt pain, but he kept on confessing God's word and in the middle of the day, he saw a physical bullet fall off the side. That's why we say these things are in existence. We know they're in existence, but we have authority over them, right? The greater one lives on the inside of us. So he, he was shot on the side. And bullet, he was confessing God's word. He was feeling pain, but he kept on confessing God's word, confessing God's word. Yes, Philemon 1.6, the communication of our faith becomes effectual by the acknowledgement of every good thing that is in us in Christ Jesus. That's the second person. Bullet fell off and he was fine. The third one, and this is where we almost get to. The third one had the dream and woke up and started laughing. He laughed. <laughs> they, they saw it as laughing in the Holy Ghost. Ooh, glory to God. You, you need to experience it. He woke up like and started laughing. <laughs> Devil, you're stupid. And he started quoting God's word. And he didn't feel a thing. He went back to sleep. I think he just laughed and went back to sleep. And he said, ha, 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 devil, you're stupid. And he went back to sleep. For him to react that way, there's a revelation of God's word he knows. That's why you need to store up God's word in your heart so that when the devil tries to communicate fear in you, it is the life of God's word that comes out. Store up God's word in your heart. So when things like this come up, ask yourself, is it consistent with God's word? Don't be worried. Say a prophet, he used to have angelic encounters. Prophets can be wrong. I'll show you from the Bible. Samuel went to the house of, of, of Jesse to anoint a king and saw Eliab and said, oh, surely he is the Lord's anointed. But that's not what God wanted. He was wrong. He, 
That's the same prophet who the Bible says that none of his words fell to the ground. He was an accurate prophet. He knew the mind of God. He knew the will of God, yet he got it wrong. So if you leave the, you know, prophet can have mood swing. So if you leave the direction of your life and how your life goes, based on what the prophet says, you will make a wreck of your faith. You will, you will suffer. But there's something that is consistent. It is God's word. So every single time I have a negative dream, every single time I hear something communicating to my heart that wants to bring fear, I just bring up God's word in my heart. I begin, I begin to quote them. I begin to reassure. I'm not even quoting them to remind the devil. That's another part. I'm, not, I'm quoting them to reassure myself, to ensure that fear does not stay here. Then when I've assured myself, I speak against that thing. So that's what to do. But if the person, you, you just have to stand your ground, right? The person who said my father-in-law was going to die of accident, when we told him, you know what he said? He said, what? That after all these years of him serving God, that you mean to tell him that he will travel with this car and he will die. He didn't pray. He traveled. And the man is fine. This is over three years now. Three, I think three years now. He's fine. He has bought another car. That car did not, didn't have accidents until he changed it. So reassure yourself of God's word. And the fact that the person is an authority figure around you or something does not change. If what the person is saying is not consistent with what God's, with what God's word is saying, be respectful. Tell the person, thank you. But if you, if you, if you see the need, you can quote the scriptures before the person. But if you don't see the need, just tell the person, thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, but this is what God's word says concerning me. I'm going to stay there. And after you have said it, don't allow fear. Because most times after quoting this thing, the devil will not say, but if you don't sow this seed, you know this problem will happen, this thing will happen, and fear creeps in. And before you know what's happening, that thing happens. It's not God's will you give in to fear. So like I said, the key thing to, to note here, like I've said here, is the fact that God can give you a revelation and it will be wrongly received. And when it is wrongly received, it will do the devil's job. So God reveals to you that the devil is planning something negative in your life and you wake up, you're scared. That's not what he intended. He wanted you to just see. Because what we're just seeing is just a, 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 a little dosage of what the devil plans. You know, the devil, like we read in First Peter 5, right? A fragment. Thank you, sir. A fragment. The devil is constantly is constantly walking about seeking whom he will devour. That's the only job he has. Yeah, you quoted the scripture that spoke against what he said. Then he went ahead to tell me to tell people I'm proud. <laughs> you have spoiled his business. That's just see. As much as I don't like talking about these things, but it's just the truth. Anybody who says I see something negative that is happening to you, come and sow seed. If you don't sow seed, this thing will happen. It's not, they, they just want to do business off your head. Mm? The God's, God's promises over your life are free. If you hold it in faith and stay there, nothing will happen to you. But if, see, when I teach these things, I always tell people, if you've not grown to the point, and this is me being sincere, if you've not grown to the point where you can stand in faith by yourself, please, you can meet somebody, say, see what happened, you know, and join, join me in prayers. Or you can talk to your prophet. I, see, this is me being sincere because your safety is of, of the highest priority, right? Yeah, don't, 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 be, don't lie to yourself, right? Don't lie to yourself. Check yourself. If you know, I can stand in faith by myself. I'm good. Without anybody, I can stand in faith. But... A few years ago, I couldn't do that. I'll probably have to, you know, I have a friend who I, I, I always pray with another. I'll probably have to reach out to him or reach my pastor to pray with me. So the fact that we're teaching you these things does not mean we are saying, if you've not exercised, it's called the exercise of faith. If, you, if you've not exercised your faith so much that you can stand in faith by yourself, that you should just kill yourself, that's not what we're saying, right? Grow. We grow in Christ, right? In knowledge, we grow in him. So if you've not grown to that point where you can stand in faith by yourself, where you know that if you say, if you tell the person, no, one from the against me, we shall prosper. You know, some of, that was some of us, we shout. The reason why we're shouting is so that it may this not happen. No, you can't, there's no need to shout. You're just calm. So if you've not grown to that level of faith, please, there's nothing wrong with 
telling somebody to pray for you. There's nothing wrong with someone standing in faith with you. There's nothing wrong with somebody praying for you. There's nothing wrong. But we're saying that it is not a sustainable thing. You need to grow to the point where you can stand in faith by yourself. Why? Because you understand God's character and you are certain that his word is sure. Mm? So that's, that's why we keep praying that the eyes of understanding will be enlightened. Right. So what was your second question? I hope I answered the first one. All right. Yes, you did, sir. Thank you so All right. much. What's the second one? The second question is um about my previous um employer, my boss that actually um oppressed me. And I prayed that um God exposes her to the true message of Christ. Oh, yeah, yeah, Christ yeah. So but so I ended the, up the being thing tired. Is, yeah, the thing, sorry, sorry about that. But hope you've gotten a good, better job now. I know, I'm still on the scout. All right, all right, all right. So in the name of Jesus, we speak over your life that Amen. times 10 of what you lost, you gain back in the name of Jesus. The Amen. earth is the loss and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell there. It says the cattle and the thousand years they are his. And because you're willing to work, we decree in the name of Jesus, that times 10 of what you lost, you get back in the name of Jesus. And that okay. would happen speedily in Jesus' name. Now, so yeah. the thing is, at the end of the day, people still have a choice as to whether to take what, you know, God is not a witch. So he doesn't force people to do what he wants them to do. That's why he don't, he's not even too far-fetched. Some of us are here. There are things that the Spirit of God has been telling us to do that we've not done. And God has not killed us. He's still patient. Right. So if you pray for someone to be open to receiving the, the, the gospel, it is still the person's will to open up. So it does not mean that your your people can exercise their will against God. It happens. And if I say people, I'm even saying even those of us who are believers, sometimes we exercise our will against God's will. So if you pray for someone to and so what, what, what will happen is that if God nudges someone's heart and the person does not do what he wants them to do he would walk that thing through somebody else that's the way god works because god's will cannot be held hostage by man right so if god says god is nudging somebody to do something nudges the person to do it nudges the person and the person doesn't do it i've heard of people who um it was their time to be promoted in an office and the boss did not um agree they prayed and prayed and prayed and the person didn't agree so, you know what happened? A superior person came and gave them the promotion and promoted them beyond that their present boss. It happens. Right? So um, it doesn't mean that your prayer did not work. What it just means is that the person has a will. You know, um, that's why um, Paul would pray, you know, against the um, the God of this um, Second Corinthians 4 4, that it, um, uh, what was it called? That uh, he was praying for light that over people who the God of this world have blinded their eyes, right? So you can take authority against the devil that is stopping the person from accepting because if someone's heart become, begins to get hardened against what God is saying, there is the devil is somewhere putting something in. So rather than bother yourself about praying for the person, after you pray that, rebuke that spirit that is resisting that person from accepting the light of God's word. But it does, like I said, it doesn't mean in any way that um, your prayer was not um, answered or it wasn't accurate. It just means that the person has a will and they can exercise it. And sometimes they exercise it and it doesn't, or like in that case, it didn't work out favorably. But like I said, God's will cannot be held hostage because a man refused to yield to him. You would see it. You would work out something that is way, way better. I've heard that thing happen several times. God nudges somebody, nudges somebody. The person doesn't agree. He uses someone else to bring about that same thing he wants to do. All right? Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. That. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Thank you. So that will be all for tonight. Um, Princess, you have a question? Yes, okay. I had a question. Okay, this will be the last one, please. All right. Okay. It's not really um practical, but I just wanted to know. Um, I'm going back to that story, right, of the fig tree. When yeah. you uh, okay, according to your interpretation, I really loved that interpretation where you said that was Jesus' response speaking to the problem. Yeah. So sometimes when some things um 
comes in our faces is good to also respond to it and not allow it to have the final say. But I want yeah. to understand something. Why yeah. was he, why did his response have to be negative? Like, okay, so the problem was that it didn't give him food at that time, right? Yeah. And yeah. he now chose to respond by drying it up. Like, it's, I don't know, it's kind of sounded confusing to me. She yeah. knows it's have uh, been him commanding it to bear fruit so that he can solve his problem why did he have to dry it up like completely even <laughs> till today do you understand like that yeah. showed a negative solution of your problem now I, I was avoiding <laughs> i was avoiding going there right now okay. so what i would do is i would attempt now this same question you're asking is like asking why didn't jesus um, correct the people who were selling in the temple. Why do you have to drive them out? Because listen, oh, listen, legit, right? If you have a business in the temple, you probably, not probably, you surely have paid the leaders of the church to use the space you are using to sell. Then you came back from, just imagine you sent someone to go and sell for you and you, the person came back. I asked, but half hours markets, yeah. Now, now Jesus come today, we can't scatter all our markets. All the animals don't run. You won't be saying, oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, glory, Jesus. No, <clears throat> you'll be angry with Jesus. Mm? You, I'm sure. Nobody, nobody will say, oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, we give you glory. Thank you. Bless you. Hallelujah. You'll be angry. So the, it's the same question you'll be asking. Why didn't you just talk to them? Why didn't you just tell them, please, don't? Why do you have to overturn their, their goods? All right? If I tell you I have all the answers, I'll be lying. And um, one of the things I've learned with teaching is the point where you don't know, tell people you don't know. So that you know, sometimes some of us try to con conjure some answers. But uh, my attempt on the fig tree is that um, uh, probably prophetic types. Uh, sometimes too, this is a very quick way to, um, not what I was going to explain, Right, I will explain something that sounds like what JJ just said now, but I won't tell you that that is exactly what it is. Right, so maybe I will do extra study on it, <clears throat> and maybe we can ask Pastor. Right, I feel it was a type and shadow. Right, so like I explained, um, then you know the, the they were running the temple. If I if I do a, an extra study on this, I would be because one of the things I learned with Jesus was he had it was a a was what, what do I call it now? It was an object teacher, an object teacher in the sense that he can bring up a teaching from something that was happening within a particular a particular place, right? So, um, like I said before, if you if you heard me, the fig tree is not supposed to have leaves when it doesn't have fruit. The way the fig tree grows is that it grows i think it 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 yields fruit first before it starts yielding um leaves so the reason why jesus came to the fig tree was because it he saw leaves on it seeing leaves on it means that the um the fig tree was supposed to have fruit in it but it wasn't the case right so now if we want to extrapolate and bring up types and sh types and shadows from it we could say that it was um um uh, a semblance of the kind of practice of religiosity that those guys had back then right you know they ran the temple without the holies of holies for several years the temple um high priest was not being appointed by roman soldiers so what they had was they had the outer court, they had the inner court, they didn't have holies of holies. So they had all the religiosity, they had what we call the form of godliness, but no power with it. So for me, I think it was descriptive of that, um, what the Jews were experiencing. Then secondly, it was also descriptive of the Old Testament and how that was supposed to be done away with, right? In the sense that the Old Testament had all the leaves this is a very good example of the fig tree, right? It had all the leaves, but no fruit. But if we see, if we see the life in the believer, we're supposed to see the power. If we see you confessing God, then it means you have a relationship with God. The Old Testament had all the form of religiosity, 
but had no fruit, had no, no life in it, right? It had no God in it. It was just a form of, of worship that didn't have. So if you see Jesus reacting to things that is not in a way that is not consistent with how you would naturally expect him to react, just know that he's telling something, he's telling a story beyond what you're seeing in the physical. So did, did, Jesus, did God pamper the Old Testament? No. What did he do? He did away with it. The Old Testament died. Do you understand? The Old Testament is like the fig tree. Had the form of godliness, had the form of religiosity, but no life, no fruit. Did When God eventually came, did he pamper that practice? No, he didn't. What did he do? He did away with it. So it's the same thing that is in that, that sorry sorry all right so it's the same thing you see in that account so he came oh you have you have all the seven steps you have all the um ceremonial washing the ceremonial cleansing you have all of that all right you should have the you should have the the relationship with god you should have the abba relationship and you come close and it's not there you know so the old testament for me i believe these two things were the things that um, because eventually, first is that the temple is no longer the place of worship. It had all the form of religiosity, but it didn't have the, that's why people had to keep on coming and coming. And the Bible says that God, the will of God is that he would not dwell in temple made by hands, meaning God wants to dwell in our bodies. So these guys had the practice, no holies of holies and all of that, and they were just worshiping God. And eventually the temple has been done away with. The second part for me, which I think is most striking, because even the temple is still under the Old Testament, is the fact that the Old Testament had all the appearance of godliness, but it didn't have godliness. It had all the appearance of being saved, but you couldn't be saved by it. So, and what was the end point of the, the Old Testament, the law? It was done away with the same way the fig tree was cursed and it died. That's the same way for us who are in Christ, the, we are dead to the law. Does that answer your question? Princess. Can we yes, hear you? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Yes, right. yes. Right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So with that, we'll come to the end of the class. Um, let's remember that it was questions that brought us this far. Um, even though I, I, I want to strongly believe that we've learned um, yeah, Adam and Eve sold fig leaves, fig leaves, fig leaves, fig leaves, mm, fig leaves. Oh, JJ, thank you. Fig leaves. See, I didn't think to this point. Fig leaves. And that's a fig tree. Uh, now, awesome, awesome. JJ, that's, that's deep. That's deep. So they sold fig leaves and Jesus cursed the fig tree. Now, the fig leaves, can we all hear me? Can we all hear me? Great. Yes. Now, the, the fig leaves yes, was what man created to cover its nakedness. That's human effort. Wow. Thank you for bringing that up. Right. So the fig leaf. So man said, oh, he, he figured I'd sinned. I'd, so what did he do? He gathered fig leaves to cover himself. When God came, he didn't keep the fig leaves. You know what he did? He did coat of skin and gave to man. So what you see, that's, 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 so, that's so spot on. Thank you, JJ, right? So what you see is the fig was a, a, a type and a shadow of human effort of the law, like we've said already, right? You know, this is a more specific. So Adam made the fig, leaf, fig leaves to cover his sin. He didn't need that before until he did what he did. So when he did it, he said, oh, I've seen that done something wrong so he did fig leaves to cover himself right and what did god do when he came he didn't pamper the fig leaves he didn't say okay let's patch the fig leaves no he took the fig leaves away and gave them coat of skin now you don't give somebody clothes made by animal skin except that you kill an animal remember the wages of sin is death right so when a man sins he's supposed to die but like our pastor said today when people went into the temple the person who sinned is not the person that dies. Why? Because God was trying to explain to us that 
the 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 um, payment for our sin will be placed on a spotless lamb. So the animal that God killed to make clothes for Adam did not sin. The animal did not do anything wrong, but God killed it. It's the same way with Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate, you see, if Pilate had said, this Jesus that you put brought here is guilty of all the sins that you put brought before him, he wouldn't have been worthy to die. But Pilate had to make that statement. He said, I don't see anything wrong. Now, Pilate was the judge. The people were the accusers, right? If the judge says you are not guilty, it means you are not guilty. No, not minding what everybody is saying. He says he's a thief. If judge says you are not guilty, you are discharged, you are acquitted. So Pilate was the judge in that season. And he said, this man, I don't find any fault in him. Meaning he's not worthy to die, but yet he died. The reason why he died was because he wasn't dying for his, for his own sin. He was dying for our own sin. Second Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we through him might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's a very, 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 it's not coincidence, fig. You know, Jesus, God took away the fig and gave man um, animal skin. Through the shedding of blood, there was remission of sin, not through the covering the human effort in trying to cover sin. That's that's very spot on. Thank you so much, JJ, for that insight. So, so we see that that's a type and a shadow pointing to the Old Testament human effort in trying to cover their sin, whereas the will of God is that there will be um, um, a um, an animal sacrifice or Jesus dying, the spotless lamb of God dying for sin as against man trying to cover their sins by themselves. We've had an awesome time. I've learned, I mean, this fig one now just took my, because I was, I was here, here, but this, this just, and uh, thank you, JJ, for bringing um, that to our notice. All right. Thank you guys. To, uh, next week, um, Sunday we we'll continue. I think next week Sunday we're taking. I can't remember the topic now, but I'm sure we'll find out um, on Sunday. Um, but every time I I have an opportunity to, to teach on believers' authority, I always love it for us to go from teaching the theoretical aspect to teaching the practical side. The practical side is us now using our authority. So in one minute, if we could, I would have said let's unmute our mics, but let's not do that. In one minute, just one minute. The Bible says, resist the devil and he would flee from you. It says, um, um, awesome, all right, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm looking for a scripture. I'm looking for a scripture so that we can pray with it. Second Corinthians, no. Oof. Whom resist ye steadfast in the faith. That should be, someone help me. Um, Tokwe, who is helping me? Who resisted fast in the faith? Yeah, First Peter five verse eight. It says, oh, I, I read from verse seven. It says, "Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour." Verse eight says, "Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that whom res that's that's the key part for me. Whom resist steadfast in the faith now." What is that thing you need to use your authority over? Now, your authority comes from what God has said. What has God said over your life? What is that thing that the devil is trying to do that is contrary to what God has said? If God said you are blessed and the devil says you are cursed, if God says um, you're rich and the devil is trying to make your life a life of penury, if God says by the by the, by the, um, the stripes of Jesus, the you you. yes, and the devil is trying to inflict sickness on you in one minute, can you, how you pray is you thank the Lord first. Now, I'm not saying this is um, word for word, right? I'm just giving you how I pray this kind of prayer. I just hold on to God's word. I say, Father, thank you for your word. I reassure my heart first and remind myself that God cannot lie and that every word of God is yea and amen in Christ. Do you know what that means? Every promise of God in Christ, in Christ is yea, meaning is done. And amen is done already. All you need to do is just say amen to it and receive it. That's all you need to do. You're not doing anything to make it happen. You're receiving. That's why it's called a yea and amen word. So I remind myself that God is true and he cannot lie. And if there's anything that is contrary to what God has said over my life, you know, that is not God, it is the devil, right? And after I've done this, I then take, I address the mountains. See, when you're addressing mountains, you're taking authority. You're not praying to God. 
Note this. When you're taking authority, you're not praying to God. You're rebuking the devil. That's the difference. There's a prayer of petition. There's a prayer of inquiry when you're asking God, what would you have me do? But when it comes to taking authority, you're not praying to God. You're rebuking the devil. Jesus says, speak to the mountain. He didn't say, speak to God. Then God will talk to the mountain. He says, 